Have you ever wished you could eavesdrop on a conversation with a millionaire? My name is Michelle Thompson. I'm a retired project controls engineer and business professor, and that's exactly what I'm gonna do in this podcast. I get to ask the questions that everyone else wishes they could. I'm gonna find out exactly how they were able to build their empires through automation and outsourcing. And I'm gonna break it down in a way that helps you build your business to run on autopilot. Don't miss out on Automate to Dominate. Hello everybody. And today we have Dr. Paul Gaskell on. He is a prior academic professor and currently has transitioned into the conservatory side of things, but also has an entrepreneurial side. So we want to talk to him actually about both of those. Paul, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Sure. I mean, I'll give you the kind of the uh, the bullet points, so <laughs> not too long, because I've done a few different things in life. But yeah, as you said, I started out in academia. I'm a, I'm a freshwater biologist by training and, and by inclination, I guess. Um, and I spent maybe about 10 years post my after my PhD, um, doing sort of uh, primary research, uh, applied research uh, into the impacts of various pollutants on uh, rivers and streams. Uh, but then towards the end of that, I had an opportunity to join a kind of a hands-on uh, habitat conservation charity called the Wild Trout Trust. Uh, I guess the nearest equivalent you might be familiar with in uh, North America would be Trout Unlimited. It's kind of a similar uh, organization to that. Um, and then beyond that, uh, I sort of started to become, well, I guess uh, interested in, in, um, creating some sort of some assets for myself that would continue to pay me even if I'm not working. So understanding, sort of turning some of my passions, some of my interests into what is hopefully useful information for, for other people as well. So they could benefit from some of the things that I've learned across the, the various experiences. My, my academic life and my sort of um, hobbies and passions are very much intertwined. So I've been a mad keen uh, angler since I've basically since I could walk. Um, and that it really, if I'm honest, the reason that I ended up being a freshwater biologist was because it was kind of like being a fisherman. So it was, <laughs> it was like the next closest thing that I could sort of, be semi-respectable and be paid for but uh now i'm just kind of casting off the shackles of any respectability and just going straight <laughs> straight for the main event and just doing what i enjoy and then uh, hopefully carrying people along the uh, the ride um on that and it does offer as well a, a degree of additional security because i'm aware that um my salary job could potentially disappear you know changing in funding structures and funding streams i'm sort of relying on somebody else's handout to kind of um to provide for me and that kind of thing and i wasn't really comfortable with that that lack of resilience so i figured i'd better work out how to do this kind of marketing and selling thing so yeah absolutely and that's you know kind of what this podcast is all about it's not the quick fix but it's the create something once and then it pays you forever type deal right yeah um, so you actually just um, wrote another book, and I'm going <laughs> to let you say the whole title, but uh, so Rediscovering Fly Fishing, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's rediscovering a particular character within fly fishing. He was um, a very interesting, a very uh, accomplished guy. It turned out to be, he was a surgeon, and I think he ended up being stationed in India. He was born in, in the southwest of England. Um, and he had quite an interesting life. So there's aspects of his biography, but also there's this kind of forgotten manuscript that he wrote. And I thought it was fantastic. It contains a lot of really uh, useful, very practical, uh, very high level information. A lot of stuff that um, fly fishers from today have probably forgotten or, or never even knew. Um, and yet this manuscript was sort of um, was left uh, relatively uh, anonymously and undiscovered. Uh, so I've, I've tried to bring that to a new audience. Um, and part of the, um, what's the word, the mechanism or the, the way that I can do that in a quite a time efficient manner is that I've actually included his original manuscript within the book. So as well as adding interpretations and um, the information and diagrams and explanations and sometimes a glossary of terms because some quite strange language going on there. 
it's allowed me to present that in a new light, but at the same time, I've not had to write sort of 200 pages from scratch because I'm using a manuscript from the late 1800s that's out of copyright and bringing that to a new audience, but I've not had to do all of, all of the legwork myself. I mean, I've got into some fairly crazy stuff, but I mean, we can get to that later on. But, but the essence is, is that um, it's finding something that's interesting, is valuable, and is, is not being brought to an audience, um, but not necessarily having to create that from scratch. Um, so that, that was the idea with that particular book. Um, and I have a copy here. As you, as you might expect. So yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, Fly Fishing Master H.C. Cutcliffe rediscovered in The Art of Trout Fishing in Rapid Streams. And The Art of Trout Fishing in Rapid Streams was his original book. And then I've got this photography and all sorts of things that, that go in there to kind of uh, spice that up as well. So that is super niche. Like, I mean, it, I mean, that's like, so narrow which is mm. awesome because the more narrow you get you know typically the better results that you have um do you find you know in england is there a huge audience for that have you sold it worldwide how how many you know copies of the book have you sold and so right so right now it's kind of starting small but building out but uh, and we're also in the in the position of we're changing from something that's even more niche than that and believe it or not to something that is a little bit more um broad sort of appeal but it's because i'm i'm not i don't have like a really established brand in that sort of the general fly fishing um audience yet the the first print run that we did i think we sold about 300 copies something like that but it's it's quite it's a it's a good sort of price point book so it's um you know it's like a 35 dollar book so it's a nice kind of coffee table size um so that's certainly enough to get us off to the races but my intention for it is and i've, I've already secured um a couple of outlets that are going to sell it on our behalf um so that i don't necessarily have to do all the marketing for that I'm also going to leverage the sort of Amazon's search engines by creating the uh, Kindle version of that uh, so that I can promote and I can advertise that. I can use pay-per-click on Amazon to drive that. But what I've seen so far is that people coming cold to it, uh, the conversion rate is really good. People people seem to want to you know hear the, the story. And I think within that highly targeted niche, which which again, it has advantages because when you are targeting that advertising or the promotion of it, um, it's very easy to identify who your target audience is and to put it in front of those people. Right. And so far, so good that, you know, the, the, uh, the uptake and the response and the, the reviews and the feedback is, is really good. Um, but I'm just at the stage now where we're sort of starting to drive that a bit more. And, and one of the intentions is to go to sort of industry targeted podcasts and to do interviews about the contents of the book rather than the process of creating the book and selling it um and that you know again that ought to lead to um more exposure and just kind of snowball from there but we're right at the bottom of the curve just now but i think it's early signs are good i think um it, it's not been a you know a hard push to sort of persuade people that this is worthwhile uh, thing to have because it's, it's quite a you know um an intriguing story e even if nothing else there's a great story behind it which obviously helps to um you know to, to get people hooked in with the curiosity sort of side of things absolutely so how what was the systems behind it like you know how did you most people have a very hard time you know everybody can start something, but actually getting it completed, right? So how did you start from point A and actually get it all the way to I'm finished writing and then I had to find a publisher and then I had to market and then I had to tell us all the background stuff. So to, to do that, I should, so, okay, a little bit of context. That This book um, came together, I uh, started writing it and then sort of went through that whole process. It probably went from zero to actually hitting the the printers within about 12 to 14 weeks so it's like quite a quick wow. sort of um but i could only do that because i'd gone through a previous process of self-publishing uh, a previous book um 
how to fool fish with simple flies <laughs> available in all good bookstores um which it that probably took me about two years to do that first one because i was learning everything from scratch and uh, i actually went through the process for the first book of working with a very good um, local or relatively local independent uh, printers who also did the design and the layout and the typesetting and that kind of thing for me. Um, and, the, and the way that we actually bankrolled that was that we did a promotion, a launch, um, which is pretty close to sort of Jeff Walker's, you know, uh, product launch formula type format, that kind of thing. Yep. But we did that on a pre-order basis so that we generated the interest, the curiosity. We realized that it was probably had enough critical mass to do that. And then because we pre-sold, we knew how many copies we would need to order so that we didn't end up with like a massive, you know, my bedroom full of unsold stock, essentially, and also no means to pay the, the printers. Right. But Which, having... Ha sorry, go on. No, that's okay. Um, like if uh, you had mentioned... Um, Jeff Walker's book launch, right? And there and there was a guy that did that. He created a board game and then bought 5,000 board games without pre-selling anything. And he literally had them in his closet, in his kid's bathroom, and no way to pay for them. And I think he sold like, what was it, like 14 games? Like it was something Yeah, insane. it was like a really low. No, I remember the story very well in the book. Because again, stories are like great things for, for retaining that sort of stuff. But, uh, right. But yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. like, so that's huge. How did you find the independent publisher and then how did you set up the process to be able to pre-sell? So part, part of that process was, um, I, I mean, initially it was the, the, the publishing side of things that was, um, purely networking and it was people that I'd taken actually guiding, I'd guided them as, as fly fishing clients. They were independently successful businessmen. It's like, oh, hey, you know, we, I, we have these kind of business breakfasts and one of the guys on the, you know, across the table from me, he runs his own publishing and, and printing company. So you guys should, should hook up and talk. So we did. And that's, that's basically what happened. Um, but what, what I've since evolved it. So I, I'm going to break it down to in several parts. Otherwise I'll get off, off track. So Knowing how and what to do in terms of the launch, that came from, uh, initially I, I, I read a book um, called, it's about email persuasion or something like that, which is a guy, a guy called Ian Brody wrote that, a British guy. That was my first introduction to the idea of internet marketing, sorry, uh, email marketing. Um, and basically the idea of creating value so that your audience is happy and ready to keep opening your communications from you, whether or not they contain a sort of a pitch or a sales message or whatever else. Um, and that, that book, you know, when you sort of obviously start to see the maths behind that and how that works, it's like, it's very convincing, very persuasive. Like, yeah, this is obviously the way forward. So that, that was probably the first step was, was Ian Brody's book. Um, then that led on to the idea of like of product launches and the idea that you have this sideways sales letter. You don't have to smash it out of the park with like a, you know, um, a Dan Kennedy or a John Carlton sort of one page, you know, direct response um, advert in a, in a magazine, which, you know, takes a lot of skill and a lot of trial and error and a lot of balls as well, to be honest, you know, to put your money behind that. And a lot of money to figure it yeah. out. <laughs> Yeah, right. you, you, but you better have, you know, deep enough pockets to, to ride through the, you know, to, to fail fast enough times to then get the hit that winner. So the idea of having that sideways sales letter from Jeff Walker's stuff really appealed to me. And following that, just relatively, um, you know, step by step and, and doing that, that allowed us to sell a few things like some DVDs and some stuff, some video products that we had as part of our our blog. So I should probably say, you know, I started the first blog in 2012, but I had zero idea about SEO or anything like that. I was just writing it because it was something I was interested in. So, you know, it was just out there. I didn't really even do it for any money initially. Um, it's the only reason that it kind of transitioned into that was it, it ended up taking up so much of my time that it was like, well, actually this has to start paying its own way. Otherwise I can't do it. And then, you know, people that read that don't benefit from it if I, you know, have to stop doing it. So there was sort of a bit of a, a need or a push to be able to, to learn how to do that sort of stuff as well, which 
you know, and that ultimately is what led me to doing the uh, Ian Pribble's stuff with the um, free or <laughs> I forgot what the, what's the um, first time internet profits is the uh, the current acronym for that. But um, this, yeah, brilliant stuff, and that that really completed you know some of the major gaps that I'd had in the in the sort of marketing side of things because I, I really had an email list before I had a consistent means of generating and maintaining those subscriptions and those subscribers. Because initially when I started out, it was real easy to go onto a fly fishing forum discussion board and just get subscribers from there um, because it's, you know, that organic reach isn't or wasn't crushed by, you know, Facebook algorithms only showing it to a small percentage of your, your audience and that kind of thing. On those forums, you just had pretty much unlimited access um, and it was real easy to generate subscribers even without a website. Um, so I, I had a list before I ever had really a website and a solid base for that, that traffic. Um, but as all these things, you know, there's the, nothing stays the same. Um, that those forums that, um, eventually over time they bled members and they, those members ended up in Facebook rather than on those particular, um, forums. So, you know, the, the place, for our audience to hang out together changed and then the rules of that sort of changed as well. Um, so yeah, that's, so that's part of the, the, the process in terms of learning how to do the, the um, promoting things via email using that kind of sideways sequential sales letter, warming people up by, you know, helping them before you ask for money from them. And then if they can decide whether your stuff's kind of worthwhile or not, and then obviously leading them to the point where if they want to take the next step, then, we exchange money for, you know, whatever it is, the, the DVD, the short course, whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, so that's how we got to that first foot in the door. And also that first practical demonstration that that kind of selling could, could work and was, you know, it wasn't just like a hope marketing exercise where you, you make something that you find cool and then, you know, it just kind of, uh, completely nose dives and uh, you end up losing a lot of money. So that, that was, you have to prove that to yourself, I think, that, that, that it can work and you can do it. Um, even if it works for other people, the fact that it works for you and your audience as well is, I think that's a, a crucial step to take and to understand. And so it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, but you now have multiple streams of income just from this journey that you've gone on because you have, uh, you mentioned a DVD that you created, um, a, several books, right? that yeah. are all passive income now. Um, yeah. And then you also have uh, following um, Ian's method, uh, a website that now has, uh, you know, is driving traffic, building your email list, as well as, um, you know, partially maybe some affiliate links on that, that website or something like that. D did I get yeah. that, hear that correctly? Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, and th there are, Yes, I'm careful that I want to diversify those streams of income so that they're less vulnerable to any shift in algorithm changes or charges for particular platforms or whatever it is so that we've got more than one stream of income. Um, I can get deeper into the tactics of how I've kind of spread that risk, particularly with self-published book material, um, if yeah, you'd like. I would I mean, love, we would, that's what we want to hear, man. <laughs> Okay, so let so let's follow the timeline then. So the first book took me about two years to to create. Got very very good reviews amongst the audience that um, bought it. Uh, that led on to the second print book. There's other stuff going on in between time. I mean, don't get me wrong, that the progress is far from straight. You know, I'm veering between different shiny objects or dead ends or you know investing in my own kind of learning and, and sort of stalling on the process along the way but in terms of the print book trajectory the next thing after um that second book which we launched just before christmas and that that did pretty well for us um was then i was able to then create a further two books the much smaller more sort of pocket guides um kind of almost like uh I guess an old-fashioned DVD case sort of size would be, the, would be the trim size of the book for those. One of them is about 130 pages. Another one's maybe 60 or 70 pages. So quite, you know, different style of book. But those two things came out, um, I think they, they came out nine days apart. So, and the, the first one took me uh, less than a month to create. And then the second one took just shy of two weeks to kind of get that shorter book out there as well. 
Now, the only reason I can do that is that rather than, basically I took the, uh, the first print book that I had professionally laid out, I then went through and understood enough of the design concepts for me to then go and buy myself a very cheap, very reasonably priced desktop publishing software. Um, it's made by a company called Serif and it was, it cost about $25 or something like that. So it's like oh, way wow. cheaper than, you know, your, your regular sort of Adobe sort of project uh, products or whatever, you know, whatever else um, you might be out there. So no, no risk at all in terms of financial outlay for, for buying that program. And then just, you know, spent maybe a week learning how to use that um, and how to recreate the the effects and the sort of the styles and the, you know, the, the design elements that you'd see in the professionally laid out book. That then gave me a lot of power because it, it cost me, I think it was about, what would it be in dollars? Maybe about $1,500, $1,600 to have the layout of the first book done. Um and then plus whatever, you know, the printing costs were to, to um, produce that. The only reason or the main reason now that this is um, especially viable is that as um, it used to be CreateSpace, it's now um, Amazon KDP, which was it, that started life as a, as a Kindle publishing platform. They now also do paperbacks and print books. And crucially, they do print on demand. And they do copies they print copies on demand and and will send them to you uh at this the unit price for whether it's one or whether it's 999 copies is the same and it's also about it's a few pence more than what we were paying if we had a print run of five or six hundred or more done at, a, at the still reasonably priced printers so there's kind of a massive economy of scale that Amazon's able to to leverage to to be able to print those off in small numbers or whatever numbers you want. And also the other thing that is incredible about that is that it also leverages the Amazon um, shipping network so that the delivery, we were paying sort of up to two, three, or sometimes maybe, yeah, over 300 pounds, so what, $400 or so in delivery costs for a shipment of 500 books, because like books are really heavy, you know, they're, and they're bulk, you know, these ones are, you know, sort of coffee table size, uh, trim size. So the shipping cost to us, even before we'd ship them out to the, the customers, was considerable. But now with that Amazon print-on-demand, that KDP service, it solves that at a stroke. And the other thing it does is it allows you to have them printed locally. So I can send them to a, a reseller in uh, the States and they will be printed in America and shipped within America so that, you know, there's no problem with the imports or, you know, delays in the shipping. It's super fast. And it also is unbelievably cheap to ship them, particularly for these heavy, you know, big full color um, books. So that was really a step change was to be able to use, um, you know, KDP to create that. And so, you know, that time invested, that two years invested in creating that first book and then the time invested in learning how to recreate that in my own desktop publishing software. It now means I've got templates for different sized books. Um, so the big books, they're color printed. Um, the smaller books, we go black and white because the printing is much cheaper and it's, it's a different genre of book anyway. Um, and so there's just layers of kind of, um, you, can sh you can really control it and really sort of get big benefits and big differences in the cost of your production, the cost of your distribution by just understanding the, the mechanics of that. Here's the crazy thing. The pr cost of printing... So it's a double-edged sword. If you're going to go color, it doesn't matter if you're on KDP, which is the Amazon platform. If you're going to have one color image in your book, you get charged color for the whole rest of your book because they can't take it off one machine and put it on another one. That doesn't work for them. And, and you can see why that is. So what, it, what that means is once you're in the territory of thinking, well, the need, this needs to be a color book, then... The great thing is the way that you get that back is that it doesn't matter what trim size it is, how big those pages are, it's just a cost per page. So it'll cost you the same to have a little novel sized trim size versus the big sort of coffee table format. So it's just a per page cost. So if you're going to go like color photographs and you know, go big you or go home. 
yeah, you just you just go for that glossy, you know, the kind of book you sit down with a glass of wine and you really enjoy sort of like looking at the photos as much as reading the text, right? And the cost is just the same per page. So you, you might as well go big. And that obviously, because you go bigger, it reduces the page count. So that, you know, it, it kind of trades off and it brings your cost down a bit as well in, in that respect. Um, so I've got these margins and all the things that you need to conform to, to go, you've got to jump through a few hoops to, to have, you know, to get your PDF up there so they can print it in the way that, that works. And they have a quality control process that it's like a two step thing. There's an automated one that flags up any really obvious things. Like you've gone way outside the lines of where, you know, you're actually allowed to print. And then there's like a, um, you know, a, a, a manual check. So somebody, a human actually looks at it and, and kind of goes through it. Uh, but they turn that around super fast. So that's how you can go from idea to creating a PDF to actually having it on sale and available. As soon as it's available on Amazon, you can order your own author copies or you can have those sent to your resellers or whatever it is. Um, so the key thing really is to, is to go through the process at least once for the different trim sizes and formats and then you just have that as a template. So once those templates are there, with the margins, everything, the trim size all set up correctly, you can then just drag any content that you've created anywhere else and then you, it's a cut and paste job to sort of reformat it. So one of the ways that I've been able to create books and publish them very quickly is to combine and aggregate related knowledge and information from uh, emails that I've sent out on a particular subject as part of, you know, just as part of, engaging with my list and giving value to my list of blog posts that I've researched and spent time drafting that and nailing that sort of down. Um, okay. There's a bit of wordsmithing involved to stitch the two things together, but it's a hell of a lot quicker than it is to sit down and write it de novo, you know, sitting down with a blank page in front of you and trying to write it from scratch. You know, that's a tough gig. Um, but that, you know, it, it, inspires you in fact to create some of that content where it doesn't even that doesn't necessarily immediately create income for you which sometimes you're sort of thinking damn you know i could spend an afternoon here i could make another video and i'll have something to sell and but then you forget that you need to do at least as much work again if not more to actually promote and then sell that thing that you're creating so the idea that at some point in the future you can draw on that pool of stuff and then and then repackage it as a print book which is a very different offering from some digital media and also from drawing it from several different sources and different areas of your life or your experience um it means it's unlikely that if you've got the kind of super fan that's actually followed each and every individual piece and they've managed to engage so uh, diligently with your email communications that every single one of your emails always lands in their e -box, in inbox and they always read it um you know, because there's always that battle for deliverability um, on email. So it's unlikely that any one individual has, has seen all of that content before anyway. And even if they have, that probably means they're such super fans that they'd be fighting over them themselves to actually order it in print format anyway. So you, you can't, you know, it, it's a good way of making sure people actually get that value you know you've gone to the effort of of creating that value for someone and it's a great way of making sure that that, that they actually have access to it and they get to experience it that's awesome advice and i think so many people forget that most of us have this whole database of stuff that we've done before and we just kind of forget about it when it's like a sitting gold mine, <laughs> just just waiting for us to do something with it to repurpose it. Yeah, and I, I even in all of our stuff, whether it was within DVD stuff or any content or whatever, I always say if I used a photograph, let's say I used a really nice photograph in a blog post. I used to be of the mindset where oh, you know, I've kind of blown that. I can't use that now in my DVDs or in my print books because I, I should have kept my powder dry because that was a really nice shot. And then, but actually, it, it's that, and also particularly the important messages that for tuition or you know for coaching and that kind of thing, that actually improves and increases in value with repetition because expecting people to get that as a one shot deal and then move on as if, Oh yeah, yeah. Nailed that. Got it. You know, understand it's, it's more important. The other points 
if something's important or if something's particularly inspiring, if it's an image, then showing that several times is reassuring people that that is something to pay attention to. That is valuable and that's what you want, you know, um, people to take home from that particular experience. So I actually think it's, it is, it goes the other way. Your instinct is that you want to protect that sort of, um, those assets and you don't want to let them go out there for free or that you can't reuse them if they have been out there for free, but actually reiterating, rephrasing, you know, I guess it's that rule of seven, you know, that you need to see or hear or experience something about seven times before it really impacts you and, and affects your, your behavior or your understanding or whatever it is. So you're actually giving people less value if you try and do a fresh, new, different thing every time and that you give them like a one shot lesson and expect them to get that. Um, you know, and and I think that's I've proven that to my own satisfaction. So, you know, um, you t- take it or leave it. But I, you know, I'd suggest that it can save you from an awful lot of legwork and being a complete pe- perfectionist about creating something from scratch every single time, and assuming that people find that more valuable when actually they probably get more out of a little bit of gentle repetition and something that's familiar to them as well. So, yeah. And I mean. Dr. Paul, you're not a perfectionist at all, so I don't understand. <laughs> For those of you who are just picking up on this, Paul and I might be friends, and I might know that he's a bit of perfectionist. <laughs> yeah, and and I and again, that's possibly one of the reasons I flag it up is that um, it's it's easy to to get down a rabbit hole and to and to to sort of take something too far when actually, you know, good enough is good enough. And also that sometimes good enough is better than, than the alternative. Um, but at the same time, it's handy to, you know, to do something to an extreme level because it, it means it gives you confidence that nothing's ever going to be too difficult for you because you've, you've done difficult things that you didn't understand before. And it turned out that, you know, obsessing about them for a bit, um, managed to, to solve it. I, f- I forget who said it, but there was somebody far brighter than me in history said something like, uh, that there's no problem so great that it can withstand a period of sustained thought. So that's sort of the philosophy I take on things is, um, there's probably a way to do something if it, if it needs done. So, yeah. Yeah. So let's say hypothetically you and I meet in a pub and I find out that you know how to publish books and I have this great hobby that I want to turn into a Amazon Kindle book. And I want to, you know, I want to start to turn that into income. What, a uh, piece of napkin notes would you give me as, you know, three steps to point me in the right direction to get me going? So f- first of all, you need to decide whether it's primarily text or whether it's going to be like a pictorial guide type thing, because that has fairly significant implications on how you go with the digital and the print formats. And you really need both. If you're going to, if you're going to use Amazon to its full extent, you need to have both. Now, when you uh, say both, you mean an ebook and a print book or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you need the digital version. You need to leverage Kindle um, and then you need to have the print book as well. People are still attached to print. People love print books more than digital. Digital is super convenient and it does sell more. And I think it is kind of climbing up there. But there's so many more print books in the world than there are uh, digital books even now. What um, about audio? Is it? easy to make an audio book once you have a print book? Uh, I mean, you can put, if you have a reasonable income stream, you know, you can get, you can audition people. There's people that will do that professionally for you. Um, and that can be, that's obviously great for, I mean, your theme of sort of, you know, being able to automate and to be able to, um, outsource stuff. That's a, an ideal example for that because there's people that are set up to do that. Now, because we happen to have to do sound engineering for our DVDs and John's a, he's got a background in, in sound engineering and, and sound production, uh, audio production, should I say, we, we can do that ourselves. And it's a case of us sitting down and reading into a mic for a period of time. So we, we can do that. You should definitely do that because it gives you another thing on the back end of Amazon's funnel that they can sell. So if you ever end up doing Amazon pay-per-click stuff, 
there's more of a chance that you can get an upsell to the audio as well. And that'll get you more return on your advertising dollars. Um, so you should definitely do that. If you have the means either technically or, um, you know, a few hundred dollars spare to pay somebody to sit down and read it, then you, you should definitely do that um, for sure. But I, w- I would say if that's a bit scary for you, you can definitely get a long way on a shoestring budget by doing the Kindle ebook version and the print version. Um, and so as I said, the, the first decision, as I said, is, is that you need to decide whether it's primarily text or whether it's going to have a lot of in- diagrams or pictures that are important to go with particular layouts and, and, and the, the appearance is important. And the reason I say that is for a primarily text-based thing where there's maybe one or two diagrams, but it's okay if it's just broadly anchored to the text somewhere in the, in the same region, is you can set that to a, a reflowing format, which is what they prefer on Kindle, which means that when people um, pinch zoom and resize it, it reflows and repaginates all of that text so that you know um, the bigger the font size, the more the, the page number is. Now, for picture pictorial based books with, that with text so that your classic sort of textbook type thing or your pictorial guide reflowing text is a disaster unless you're uh, probably someone who's amazing at coding could probably make it work but you know that's not me <laughs> so i'd rather you know me done either. is better than perfect um so that what you need to do what we've done is that the the way I derived the trim size for our smaller books was that it matches roughly a seven inch tablet screen so that I can set up the Kindle version as a print replica, which is it's just a box that you tick, you know, it's not, it's not complicated. You could sit down and, and work it out without me even describing how to do that. Um, but you set it up as a print replica PDF, which is the pages are set. Um, but what you need to do is if you've got a big, eight inch by 10 inch format print book, you need to reformat that into a sort of a seven by five inch or five by seven inch um, format, but it needs to be fixed. So that has an implication on how you set those two things up. But if, if you have templates for both of those trim sizes um, in your desktop publishing, you've done it once. Once you've done that once, it's relatively easy to just drag things around and just drag and drop and resize things and, and put it where it needs to be. Um, you know, not not a an onerous process, but you know, quite tedious. But you can you can get it done in a fairly short period of time, or you can pay someone to do it. Clearly, you know, if if your time is worth more than that, and you have somebody that can do it for a cheaper price than your hourly rate, you should outsource it absolutely. Um, so that then gives you uh, two things. It gives you you end up with a print book for that, and you also end up with uh, a Kindle book. Now, the important thing about having a Kindle book is that you can offer that on various promotions and you can also have it in the Kindle online lending library where people sign up for that for a fixed fee on Amazon and then you get like a few pence if somebody reads several pages of it for free. They don't pay any more to read your book. But what that does is it Amazon will start pushing that out to their subscribers. When they say things like, you know, so many reads for 99 cents on this, daddy, 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 whatever it is, they'll start emailing people and sort of pu- giving push notifications to people about your book. And you, you, I can see it on them, my sort of, uh, you know, reporting data from Amazon uh, KDP. You know, there'll be a spike where they've obviously been pushing it on Kindle Online Library and Kindle Unlimited. And then after that, you get a rash of sales of either of the ebook, but also of the print book. And then that's, we make a much bigger margin on the print book than we do on the, the ebook. Because um, they constrain your pricing quite tightly in order to, in order for you to get the 70% royalties from the ebook side of things, you have to price it between, I forget, it's about $2.99 and about $9.99, something like that. If you stray outside of that, then you only get 35% commission. Um, and the thing they don't tell you that they bury in the small print is that there is a fulfillment cost. So the more color photos and more pages you've got on a Kindle product, they actually charge you more from that. So that's why your royalties often deviate from that 70% thing. Um, it depends on, um, it's actually not the per page, it's actually the, it's the file size. So you have to get good at, at riding that picture compression 
tight rope so it's still good quality but it's not it, you know that file is as small as possible so that you don't get absolutely caned on the uh, the delivery cost that uh, kindle puts out there but basically if, you, if your kindle book is acting as um you know the widest end of your funnel the idea is is that you get people to buy that print book through that um so on to the slightly st- not advanced but it's, it's hard won sort of knowledge really um because we also sell on different platforms and we sell digital products, whether they're membership sites where it's like a short course where people get to log into that and, and consume eBooks and video material and audio books, or it might be just a straight download of an eBook. There's a stipulation in the KDP contract that if you want that 70% royalty, you have to give them exclusive rights to sell that, uh, ebook in in Kindle Unlimited. Um, now you can you can enroll in that for a period of time. You have to go in for like a minimum minimum of twelve weeks, but you can continually drop it in and out of that if you want. But what we tend to do is to create slightly different versions, or we might do a compilation version as an ebook that we sell off our own platform and our own website. And then the version that you get in Amazon is a different book. Um, so it, it would qualify for a different ISBN number if you were sort of publishing it like that. So even if someone was able to kind of piece together the same sort of material elsewhere, there isn't a, basically what they don't want is people just price comparison, comparing and looking across to other platforms rather than buying it off Amazon. So you just make the thing on Amazon unique and you're good to go. But that doesn't mean that that content is lost to you in terms of selling it in other other places you just have to be sure that it's different enough that it doesn't qualify as the same thing um so we we use a platform called gumroad which is actually very good because um it allows you there's no bandwidth limitation so we sell hd video and the most of those platforms that allow you to to sell and to, to market hd videos they charge you for bandwidth and they absolutely cane you for that as well because storage is so expensive. But Gumroad's amazing. It just just says, right, no, in no limit. You just sell what you can sell. Um, and also you, can, you can give away free copies and if you do that, you don't get charged for that either. So you can do some very good um, promotional stuff on that. So we, t- we tend to end up with our, print, uh, our e-books on Gumroad. They tend to be embedded within our Kartra membership um, products and they also tend to live on Amazon as well. And of course, the pages inside those books l- cross link to our other products and our website and that kind of thing as well. So even if we're not making a lot of money from an ebook, it's sending traffic to our site or it's subscribing people to an email list or it's pitching another product directly. Um, so it's, we're leveraging those search engine optimizations for the titles and the descriptions that you put in your book um, to then get you know acquire a customer in in another part of your business as well um but as i say in terms of the making the money because you can print those copies and sell there's no restriction on where you sell your um, print copies so you don't have to make a different um, print version that you sell on different platforms um so that the identical print book that you can sell uh, on amazon you can have author copies sent to yourself or you can have them printed locally and ship and shipped to people that are selling for you overseas. That's all good. Um, and if you've got an audio book version of that, so much the better because as I say, you just get those upsells and that, that sort of uh, bigger return on the back end. Awesome. That's amazingly helpful. <laughs> Cause I wouldn't even know where to speak. I wouldn't even know where to start. So. I think that's it. I mean, I so I've probably spent around about three years getting to that point, but now I've done that. It's not that hard. It's just a, t- a time investment, a self training, a self improvement um, process. But once you're there and you have those skills, it becomes quite easy for you as an individual. And it's something that can be quite valuable to other people. So, you know, it, it might be that say for whatever reason I can't make money um, in something else. I know that I can, you know, I could publish books for other people and, and get commissions and do affiliate sales and whatever else on that. So um, I, might, I may, if I ever get time, I might even create uh, an online course for how to do this stuff, how to self publish on a shoestring budget. And some of those tips that I've just given out there it would certainly be, you know, within that, but you know, it, it wouldn't be that difficult to create a course where you provide those templates and those margins and those those hard-won sort of practical settings that 
it sort of feels like you're beating your head against the wall to set them up for the first time. But once you've got them, they're a great asset because you just drag things in there, send it off. You go through the review process. You know that your templates will let you fly through that review process. So that happens quickly and you don't get a dozen revisions backwards and forwards before they approve it. So that brings up a great question. Let's say um, somebody had a question and they wanted to get a hold of you. How could they do that? <laughs> so the the best email address for me is paulgaskellflyfishing at gmail.com. That's the most kind of universal one. But um, if in doubt, uh, you can go to our new newest website, which is fishingdiscoveries.com. And there's a contact form on, on there as you'd expect from a website. Um, but you can also... Uh, subscribe on uh we have two youtube channels we have tenkara uh, discover tenkara is one of our youtube t channels the other one is going to be fishing discoveries um as well uh and then also you know we have facebook groups i have a facebook presence i'm paul gaskell on on facebook <laughs> and if there's a if there's a ton of fish pictures uh, associated with my profile you've probably got the, the right dude um but it, yeah the, the spelling is the only tricky thing i suppose on the email and it's uh g-a-s-k-e-l-l -L, because a lot of people want to put i double -L, l at the end because it sounds uh, more sensible and probably is but uh yeah there you go we're just awkward like that <laughs> dang Brits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, we kind of talked about this before we started, but, um, don't be hitting Paul up for a whole bunch of free information. So he has an hourly rate. So if it's something that you want, you know, some information you want him to mentor you, uh, get a hold of him and he'll be uh, very happy to, to let you know about that. So, um, and he's a nice guy, but don't take advantage of him being nice. So everybody. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Paul, this has been absolutely amazing. Um, I think you've definitely given enough information that if somebody wanted to go down this road, you gave them way more information to be able to be dangerous and, uh, and get it done. <laughs> so um, anything else that you would pop in and add as closing remarks? Uh, just to, to thank you so much for having me on and uh, and for um, you know allowing me to geek out on this stuff because uh, you know it's it's a, it's a great outlet because <laughs> but yeah seriously thank thank you for uh, for taking the time and, and asking such uh, such great questions and uh, yeah let's do it again sometime oh yeah that that sounds awesome and thank you again for the time I really appreciate it and so for everybody who doesn't know um, in the microbiology world Paul is a god so um, <laughs> he's even got his own like chapter in a biology book so uh, it's very impressive on brown trout you guys should look it up so um, all right thank you so much Paul and we will catch you guys next time thank you for tuning in to the automate to dominate podcast at www.awesomeoutsourcing.com slash podcast. My name is Michelle Thompson. Hey guys, if you absolutely love this show, I would greatly appreciate it if you would head on over to iTunes, subscribe and leave us a five-star written review. That would be amazing. And as always, if you guys know somebody who should be listening to this podcast, Please don't keep it all to yourself. Share it with your friends. <laughs>